a pretty straightforward. But this one here, I'm going to go to the back of the ankle, Jan. Uh, this is an older gentleman, had a low energy uh, fall. He does smoke and he's COPT, COPD with, uh, on O2 in a bigger guy. So it kind of comes in with this low energy trauma, posterior medial Taylor body fracture. And, you know, his bone just doesn't look healthy, right? It looks, doesn't look that dense. It looks kind of osteopenic. Looks like somebody who may be on, you know, some steroids probably in relationship to, to some of his lung issues. So posterior medial, Jan, how are you managing something like this? Yeah, these are very difficult uh, fractures um, to, to handle, right? And they, for me, I, I go prone for these and do a posterior medial approach. How are you using, what's your, we just did approaches with our residents. So how are you, what's your, what's your interval if you're coming at this? Yeah, I, I work on both sides of the FHL actually. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just a, you know, unfortunately you're seeing it, going to see the neurovascular bundle. There's a very good paper by, um, out of, uh, by uh, Sclero and Andy and Andy Sue. He was one of my residents uh, back in Chicago and is this from him? I don't know. Uh, I don't know uh, if this is, this is one of them, but. You know. Okay. And they did a very good paper with a lot of good images uh, from it. So I think it's, um, you know, very helpful to, you know, to, to kind of look at and prepare, but, you know, you're, you're looking at the neurovascular bundle and, and so forth. Yeah. So I think, I think that the point is well made that, you know, you kind of come off the border of your Achilles tendon and then you sweep FHL you can go on either side of it, um, but you, you do have the neurovascular bundle there. Um, so this is, um, you know, prone posterior medial approach, used a femoral distractor in this case as well uh, to try to gain some exposure. And then 2.0 rim plate uh, along the posterior, um, posterior medial talus, which I was reasonably happy with the way that came together. Yeah, that looks great. I mean, it's, and but I'm I'm a little confused. I've never seen a fankel surgeon operate at 9:51 p.m. Huh. That was that was that was a while back. <laughs> All right, just making sure you're okay. <laughs> that was that's a that's we'll have to have that conversation over a bit. Okay. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that. Uh, so anyway, so you know, able to get it reduced. You know, thoughts on fusing this? I mean, his joint doesn't look that great there. Yes. Thoughts on using this, this plate you mean, or, or using it, using it. Uh, I mean, I would try to, I would give, you know, if it's a young, healthy patient, I give it a shot. Um, I don't think you're wrong to fuse it, you know, if someone or, but, uh, I don't know. Like, I think you could, I could still, I think you could still do a fairly straightforward fusion with that hardware in there. Okay. That's what I thought too. So this is where we're at. This is at, three months, I think. And, you know, that hardware is just kind of holding on. <laughs> you can yeah. see it bending a little bit. Joint looks a little bit suspect at this point. I'm thinking, oh man, I hope this is, and he says he's doing fine. He like walks in. I don't think he's listened to a thing I told him. And then he calls about Whoa. a month later and he's like, oh, my ankle's killing me. <laughs> so now what? <laughs> Yeah. So I think you just got to, I think I would rule out infection. That would be my first thing in AVN. Yeah, I mean, it could point. be both right. Infection and AVN. Yeah. And, you know, once you knew that was not the case, I would fuse this and, you know, I would use a bone, some type of bone block. You know, I, I tend to use allograft, but I have used, you know, iliac crest. I mean, yeah. I'm a patient, you know, so I, I went round and round and this guy, he is not active. He is not healthy. Mm -hmm. And I've had, some bone blocks do great, and I've had some bone blocks not do so well. And so I ended up just fusing them in situ. And, you know, I oh. felt like that looked okay. I thought that you yeah, kind of got it jacked out to length, and I got the piece out. I, I was able to do this one uh, just lateral. So I was able to kind of make, you know, sneak around the posterior through the lateral incision and, and get that piece out and then prep the joint through a separate sinus incision and, you know, bringing screws from, you know, top to bottom. And overall, pretty pleased, you know, his, his post-op, he did sag a little bit. He healed, but he does have, you know, he does impinge up the front a little bit. Um, so this is why I kind of thought, you know, made the case that maybe initially, if I'd have fused him right out the gate, I was looking at the joint anyway. Um, it would have been, it wouldn't have been a huge deal to add uh, subtalar screws 
I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right answer or not. Um, but uh, he seemed, you know, he did well, and and I was overall pleased with the way it came together. But yeah, I think it's it's tough. And you know, Keith has a question here: Would you do an implant over a fusion for posterior fracture if patient had a good blood supply? And I would choose to do an implant over fusion usually. But it and the thing is, I think it's difficult for trauma is that you know patients you know, they were doing fine, like the day before this all happened, right? The yeah. hour before it all happened. And so it's, it's, I think it's very hard to try to convince them like, hey, now you, you need a, an acute fusion. It's almost like, they, I feel like the way, maybe it's how we sell it or frame it. Yeah. Like it's mm -hmm. failure of like, oh, I can't fix it. So I got to fuse it. But it's not like fusing something is easier. Yeah. But I think sometimes it does have better acute results. Yep, I agree. You know, and, and, and when I go back and look at his CT scans, you know, he had some, had a bit of arthritis and I, I maybe could have yeah. sold that part too. And um, so it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things that hindsight's always going to be 2020. But these are, these are some of the questions that I think we, we raise. And you can see that these can be challenging injuries and sometimes require a little bit of, you know, thinking outside the box. So, well, that's about an hour. I think we could probably bore you to death with all things Talus. And now you know that you can buy uh Taylor dice, which I got to get myself a pair. Maybe that could be a good resident gift, huh? Yeah. For, you know, the, the, the resident of the year on uh, uh, trauma. And the Fankel service. Yeah. The Fankel service. They can wear yeah. them around their neck. And, you know, I think, you know, just for all the reps out there, I mean, this is something like these fractures of the foot and ankle, um, all joking aside, is that, you know, you need to be prepared with all different types of implants because you never know what you're going to need. And it's not just going to be one size fits all. So it's going to be small plates, mini frag, you know, even even larger than like in this case, six, five, you know, it looks like six, five or something or seven oh cannulated screws here. Uh, and I think that just having all those tools in the toolbox really helps us out as surgeons. And I, I like when, you know, all the options are there because you just never know if something's going to, yeah. you know, and a, a fixation turns into a fusion. If you're doing a calcaneus and you're going to uh, do an RIF plus a, and fuse it, it's nice to have plates and screws available. And you never know, like, even though, uh, I mean, we, we joke around, we say we do it the same way every time. I wish that were the case, but it's not. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. And, and I think, you know, I wish I could tell you, you know, always have, you know, you, you just need to have these things there. Uh, you know, we kind of talked about some of the smaller frag screws and, and things like that, but uh, having a, having a couple extra options available or close by, I think is, is pertinent. So any other thoughts, Jan? No, that's it. I think there's some great cases uh, outlining the difficulty of uh, Taylor's fractures. And, and I think just it's a good understanding of look at the imaging, the comminution. These fractures are uh, difficult to uh, treat. And, uh, you know, many times lead to sequelae. So it's kind of, uh, it's an, it's a, it's, it's a fankle annuity uh, yes. sometimes, as long as you don't keep on moving around, Nick. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, if there's questions that come up, reach out. And uh, hopefully well, this is uh, helpful for you. I'll work on sending out a little newsletter with some, some summary stuff. And uh, we'll work on releasing the date for July here in the next week or two. And I think we had on either tibia fractures or calcaneus fractures. We've kind of been sticking trauma heavy. Uh, Jan and I will chat about it and see, uh, you know, which one we want to hit on. I guess, Jan, you said you had a bunch of calc fractures that you've been managing. Maybe we could do that next uh, next month. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, calcaneus or tibia, I think would be great. Yeah, either one. All right. You guys take care. Thanks, thanks a lot. Right, see you guys. Yeah.